on the rather broad subject of uh, diversity of knowledge and skills and and uh, divides between uh, knowledge prosper, prosperous knowledge cities and other places. Uh, we've we've got uh, with us uh, Maria Abreu, the University of Cambridge, from the uh, uh, Department of Land Economy there, and Marta Solheim from uh, from the University of Stavanger, Center for Innovation Research in the Business School. Uh, there in, in, in Norway, and as a discussant, our own Federico Rossi. Very glad to have them all here, and uh, I won't take uh, more of your time introducing them, but uh, we'll we'll start with, with Marta. Thank you so much, Frederick. I'm very honored to be invited to be here with you today, so I'm very much looking forward to discussing these important issues with you. Um, I have uh, a few slides I would like to share with you here. So first of all, um, I thought it was really interesting to see some of these really big questions that you brought up. So how do education, knowledge and skill affect regional differences in productivity, innovation and opportunity? And how can these outcomes be shaped by local and regional institutions and how so by national policy? So these are, you know, really big questions and, uh, you, uh, you know, you can tackle these from various different sides. I mean, coming in from um, going into education, knowledge and skills from looking into migration and differences in uh, urban rural divides. You could go in and look at the role of higher education institutions, etc. So I just decided to go about it a little bit on trying to integrate two um, papers that I have currently, hopefully soon published um, in review on tackling a little bit of the systemic perspective and one is tackling more the firm side perspective of uh, skills and dynamic capabilities and I've tried to integrate them a little bit to tell um, what hopefully will be uh, a coherent narrative. So um, then I throw up some some sort of um, ideas on policies or what this could all mean uh, joining these two papers in the end and um yeah let's see if it works out and please just uh, do feel free to ask me questions but i i understand that i will just continue now for around 20 minutes and then hand it over to you um frederick afterwards so i wanted to start off by um telling a little bit of a story of why i became interested in this topic because i think it, it entails and, and sort of explains a little bit more of these micro foundations of how knowledge and skill could also um, affect uh, innovation and productivity. So before joining and sort of becoming an, uh, an academic or starting my academic career, I was working in the maritime cluster uh, in, um, in Norway and I was working for Deem and then later for Rolls-Royce and here you can see me uh, on the bicycle going in, uh, talking to the welders. And there I realized, you know, this is a very international industry and they had, um, this was around the financial crisis. So I realized, you know, I need to, to get a move on and maybe acquire some new skills and do something else uh, before everything, um, before I'm left without a job. Um, so I started doing my master's and I did it together with a research institute. So it became a report and I worked with some really excellent researchers there. Um, and I wanted to investigate the role of foreign born workers in the maritime industry because I realized, you know, there were a lot of these um, international connections. There was a lot of foreign born workers in this industry. So I decided to go about studying this and I asked two questions and I, these questions are stuck with me. Um, I reckon uh, maybe perhaps for life because the two questions that I asked at that time, the first one was how do these foreign born workers perceive the places that they move into? And the second one was how do these foreign born workers contribute to innovative processes within these companies? And I looked at over a hundred different companies in seven different municipalities, uh, both through survey and, and interviews. And I really, you know, it, originally when I, when I had these two questions, I thought these are separated. 
One is about how they perceive the places. The other one is how do they do, what do they do within the firms? But I realized that these are, these were connected and this perhaps, you know, this is no surprise to you and not for me now anymore. But at the time I was, that was like my most puzzling finding that this places as really as centers of meaning and how we become attached to it and how we exclude people from it, how we experience places. And the main finding stemming from that work was that these highly skilled workers, they they really said that those social ties in places were affecting the opportunity that they had within the companies. Um, and, and, and talked a lot about these sort of the strength of the, the, the weak ties and, and talking about the strong ties and how they could see many potential um, arenas where they can contribute, but they were not allowed into these places. So I was invited to go back and talk about these findings. Um, and uh, and I, I mentioned, you know, how these are, are related and not. And after that, they, they did a lot of things in that uh, in those uh, communities, trying to bridge what is happening in these social arenas and the, in these places and also within the firms. So a lot of these issues relate also to more of the micro foundations of how we are uh, communicating, how we are interacting and speaks to more of this, a lot of the work that I've done on primary and secondary diversity characteristics. So primary are, for example, foreign born workers, elements you cannot change, whilst secondary diversity characteristics are the skills and education experience, etc. But all of these are context dependent and interpreted differently. So you would say that diversity in many ways is difference on any attribute that could lead to the perception that that other person is different from self. And it also can be effective affecting how we are being treated in the workplace or perhaps also in the places that we are living, as I mentioned. But it also can speak to the way we work or engage outside through learning through urban labor pools. And I will not spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to mention a little bit of sort of also the underpinnings of a lot of the work that I've been doing is on the similarity attraction perspective. So how birds of a feather flock together, we prefer to engage in people that we perceive to be similar to ourselves. And then, you know, it, it, it runs smoothly. We feel that it's comfortable. But then on the other hand, you have this cognitive resource diversity perspective, holding all the gains that you have from working with the similar others. But of course, that could increase conflict. It can uh, increase distrust and uh, the need for communication. So that are some of the underpinnings of the two papers that I will now try to sort of really get cracking on. So these two papers, I'll try to sort of bridge, bring, bring them together to answer a little bit more these two questions that were sort of the focus of today's session. The first one is called One Coast Two Systems, where we look at regional innovation systems and entrepreneurial discovery in Western Norway. So here we, we try to give a theoretical contribution looking into how the regional innovation system typically been seen to consisting of two subsystems underpinned by an institutional infrastructure. So these subsystems are referring to a region's industry, so their firms, entrepreneurs, clusters, value chains, and then you also have the knowledge infrastructure of universities, R&D institutes, incubators, etc. So we contend that for um, that the proposal for policy oriented entrepreneurial discovery process will differ between the different types of um, regional innovation systems. And we also we want to provide a framework in this paper that could understand the changes needed in different systems and the opportunities and challenges faced within these respective systems. And here we also um, talk about how these the focus of, of this paper also is that we need to remain cognizant and congruent of multiple stakeholders diverse interests within a region um, and then also here we, we start sort of saying that we need to consider how differences in your innovation or entrepreneurial discovery process will be different also depending on where um, you are so we're trying to bring to together here the regional innovation system literature with also the more emergent inter entrepreneurial discovery process literature within uh, smart specialization, etc., that is um, really discussed a lot. So here, um, you know, here, you know, I should as um, regional studies also have a, um, a map of how you know 
Bergen and Stavanger because of obviously these are known terms to me, but they I live in uh, Stavanger. This is where we are sort of the oil capital in Norway and then you have Bergen. It's just five hours north drive from here, but they are representing very different regional innovation system. So here we argue that the type of regional innovation system, if you have a specialized or more in inclined toward diversified, will influence stakeholder ideas on how to support future industrial development. So more precisely, we contend that that these, uh, as I mentioned, the, the process of entrepreneurial discovery process will differ between these two uh, regional innovation systems. So the diversified has a very heterogeneous industrial structure. So this could be different clusters, different types of industries, and they have the knowledge and support organizations that are also varied, including educational facilities and R&D institutes that can facilitate innovation in different economic and technological fields. So this type of risk is most often found in large core regions such as uh, metropolitan area areas and advanced technology regions. And then you have the specialized and this type is dominated by one or few industries and may have some large clusters that include the dominant industries, but also the knowledge and support organizations in specialized risk are tailored more towards this more narrow uh, industrial base and the institutional framework support this dominant industry. And these uh, regional innovation systems are, are very typical for old industrial areas and industrial districts. And it's also often stated that these specialized risks may experience lock in situations. So here our research motivation is that we will, um, our first sort of hypothesis is to look into the development of an EDP is likely to require different approaches between regions that are characterized by specialized or diversified regional innovation system, giving the regional economic structure. And the second one is looking into how the narratives among regional stakeholders surrounding entrepreneurial discovery and regional development strategies will differ between stakeholders in specialized and diversified uh, regional innovation systems. And, you know, uh, due to the time constraints, I'll go a bit uh, quickly through it, but we did sort of an empirical analysis um, done by Jason Deegan here on this, um, on, on how um, the how sort of the economic structure of these um, uh, Bergen and Stavanger looked like and then we did qualitative analysis in sort of the context of this entrepreneurial discovery process and we tried to integrate them uh, together uh, as to shed light on different stories. So here um, in the quantitative side, we divide it into four different sort of um, themes or pillars, and it is concerning industri industry relatedness, industry size, occupation skill complexity, and location co coefficient. And here, the, the our measure of relatedness is in line with Hidalgo approach to understanding relatedness. So in this work that we do here, relatedness is understood as two activities such as products, industries or research areas that require similar knowledge or input. So here the relatedness could also, um, as we argue here, be considered a sort of a risk assessment where high degree of relatedness in a region can be understood of um, containing a high degree of success in entering new activities, be that technology, products, industries, etc. And we also did a computation or, or Jason did here for the location coefficient for both regions is constructed to capture the specialization within that given region. So that is compared to the national um, context so that you could sh you could compare the share of a sector in a local economy um, in relation to average employment observed in the broader national economy. But also here we computed uh, complexity looking uh, as per Balland and Rigby uh, 2017 within an industry as organized according to the, the statistics Norway general industry classification. Uh, and we also um, try to look into the industry size um, herein. So basically, and uh, we also did this qualitative um, data where we gathered 22 interviews in um, the regions where we look, we interviewed investors, um, industry actors, educational, uh, higher education institutions and TTOs and, and policy actors to shed light also on how this uh, EDP processes are likely to unfold and and how they could how they collaborate and communicate etc. Um, so the results moving very quickly here um, here I mean 
overarchingly, what we find in this story here is that the main narrative here is that relatedness is where the regions uh, Stavanger and Bergen really are uh, different. We see that Bergen is really uh, diversified and Stavanger is really specialized. As I mentioned, it's been the oil capital for, um, for, for several years and we also there's been a shift also in how the higher education institution started uh, because of this, they needed to provide the knowledge and skills for that industry. So that has been really embedded in um, in, in the story of Stavanger. So much of Stavanger's um, is contained in the related manufacturing sector and in mining and quarrying, whilst Bergen is diffused um, across a number of sectors. But also when you're going when in this location um, coefficient for both regions uh, being constructed to capture the, the specialization within a given region in relation to the national context, we find that across a number of sector, Bergen exceeds the, the national average and it contains a competitive advantage in a more diverse set of activities, lending um, credence to the specialized diversities versus this diversified um, of um, Stavanger. And also this is being supported in, in the qualitative findings that we have for Bergen. They talk a lot about also this path dependent narratives, how that they are looking for markets that are not so very different for the, for, from their existing markets, but they are also highly emphasizing that that they are in our sense, in our smart specialization thinking, that we're going to adapt and develop the interfaces of fisheries, salmon farming, the energy sector, the oil and gas sector, shipping, but also agriculture and tourism. And we're so lucky in our region that we have several legs to stand on. Whilst we see for Stavanger, the stakeholders in Stavanger believe that the oil and gas industry will remain the largest component of the regional economy in the future. So they talk a lot more about the greening of the economy and how they can use technology from the oil and gas within other industries, but mostly that they have a responsibility to produce uh, and deliver green oil. We can say it like that, green oil and gas. We are, and also um, they, they really emphasized, like this quote shows here that we are in mind, heart and soul, an oil and gas region, and that is what we're known for. But we now talk about the energy region, but we don't own that as wholeheartedly as we did with oil and gas. But also we see a lot of differences here with um, when it comes to um, investment and how in Stavanger they say that particularly they're afraid of investing um, investment going to forest, which is the admin administrative area of the oil and gas industries, because they 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 fear that is like Houston, that's too far away from the dock. So they the investors they really claim that the further away from the dock, as long as it becomes more sort of shifting papers and moving around, we don't know what it is. So there's really also this idea of path dependence in terms of what kind of uh, projects will get um, funding. There's also um, a lot of discussions regarding what I was mentioning of birds of a feather flocking together. So this conformative seeking behavior from the investors also wanting to invest in projects that uh, through families that they already know, through uh, projects that they have supported in the past and seen success with, very risk averse uh, capital um, spending and uh, in, in that region is what is being highlighted. So here we have created this table that we um, try to really look into this analytical framework that we propose here. Um, and here I would just like to highlight some of these typical barriers for entrepreneurial discovery process is for these specialized regions. Is this really strong network? So this really goes back to the story I was telling in the beginning, right from from the first stepping stone into um, at the start of, of uh, my master's, seeing these strong ties in these regions, how that could also affect who is getting funding and who's not and and how that is hampering alternative ideas and competence. But then you also see that there could be some barriers for entrepreneurial discovery process in the diversified regions because they have a very fragmented innovation system, hindering knowledge exchange between the different subsystems of these regional innovation systems. So one could have a risk of having more of a lock in uh, also due to these social ties, whilst the other one could be to spread out and they don't have this knowledge exchange um, because of it. So 
here sort of to, to just sum up this this session of, of that paper is that there exist notable differences both in how diversified and specialized risks are likely to engage in bottom-up entrepreneurial discovery process approach and narratives while not entirely harmonious within the respective risks does differ in how stakeholders under regional change so yes we can uh, you know, and there's a lot of further discussion here. We could um, just to give you a little bit of a um, push for the for some questions and answers and also your reflections. Like, could we also discuss a little bit like changes in the institutional infrastructure, um, you know, policy implications here, the capability coordinations and, and uh, institutional failures, etc. But I see that I've been very optimistic about time here, so I will just go through this and, and I think I will have to go and just I have two minutes left, right? Yeah, yeah, so OK, so this paper, you know, that will be like the little stepchild that will not get a lot of attention. Um, what I will show you here is just um, this. This is work that I've done here with Orsta and Kvitastein, and we try to look at, you know, when the price of crude oil dropped into in, in 2014, many Norwegian enterprises in affecting regions, they lost revenue. So here we try to make this conceptual multi-level model where we looked at regions oil dependency before the decline in the um, in the oil price. And then we look at the enterprise level of um, of the dynamic. And then we, we, really, we like to try to look at the dynamic capabilities in these enterprises. So we try to see whether or not these dynamic capabilities alleviate enterprises revenue shock after this, this shock of this oil crisis. And as I've mentioned in the first paper, you know, Stavanger is, is the oil capital. So how did that really um, affect um, those regions also? So we combine data on regional oil dependency and enterprise and personal level data before the decline and also look at the enterprise revenues before and after the, the decline. And then, you know, I don't have time to go into all of these details, but what we did here is that we try to look really into TESA's um, cap dynamic capabilities involving sensing, seizing and transforming and, and, and sort of try to put in categories or, or variables that could reflect the, those activities of sensing, seizing and transforming. So I, and this is sort of the, the main point here because that this is what I, I try to link and I have to be um, aware of that this is, I mean, our focus in this paper is on dynamic capabilities on the enterprise level. And um, so, you know, of course you could, you could argue that, you know, you could look into regional resilience um, and sort of higher level concepts, which we have not done here and sort of the, the capacity to recover from external shocks. But I wanted to mention here that here we find in these 4,060 enterprises in 51 labor market regions demonstrate that it is the unrelated educational diversity that alleviates revenue losses for enterprises in strongly affected regions, while related educational diversity has an operative, uh, opposite negative effect. But we also see that, that innovation activity and R&D investment alter revenue growth, but these are consistent across more or less affected regions by the old decline. So we argue that these concepts are static rather than dynamic capabilities. So the point I'm trying to make here and trying to bridge these two together a little bit is that on the one hand, I've tried to discuss this um, specialized and diversified innovation systems uh, and how they are um, and how they are demonstrating different like this danger of locking by in, in in the specialized regional innovation system and in the diversified they have you know several opportunities because they have uh, you know flurry um, due to the flurry of research activities and entrepreneurship but a hampering factor here could be the lack of support but then on we also find in that other paper, despite it being on the on the enterprise level, is this role of unrelated educational diversity. So, you know, if we see here that people and places are producing path dependence and here under industries, location decisions affect future skill levels and regional economies. And also, you know, as I mentioned, the, the migratory patterns and stretching out of social relations. How do we see that in oil dependent regions, particularly unrelated educational diversity is important, but that with this within with the sort of the fear of being specialized then. So how how could you sort of uh, knowing that it is the unrelated di educational diversity, but in the specialized regions where you perhaps have a higher education institution that are pushing for more of the same. So I don't have time to to go through this. I just wanted to throw this up and I think this is taking it too far. But are we saying here that people and places are mutually constitute one another, coloring and marking one another? 
and that places do not just exist. You know, you need to, it's created through people and say, you know, how social individuals engage. But, you know, and this is where we come to the, the end is that in essence, these relations and interactions shape and influence space and regional development. Um, and that they do not only come from economic factors, but we do see that here they do come from economic factors because the economic factors are inf uh, influencing who is getting inv uh, invested in it or not. And that is also that investment is producing path dependence. But at the same time, we do find evidence that it is this barriers when these social interactions are um, hampering um, or, or, or stopping and, and producing path dependence. So, I mean, this was really um, all I wanted to say per now, and I uh, think I was a bit too optimistic with uh, with my time. So I'm sorry about that. But I mean, now we will continue uh, with Maria. So um, and then we could have some discussion afterwards. So I hope this made a little bit of sense, at least. Um. <laughs> very, very much, very much. And thank you very much. And this is, uh, this is a terrific start we have here. So we'll hold questions until uh, we'll, go to, we'll go to Maria and then to Federica for some overall comments and then we'll take uh, uh, general questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. OK, um, well, that was really interesting. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, I do actually have some thoughts on the finding on unrelated educational diversity, which links quite nicely, I think, to what I think is going wrong in the UK. Um, okay. So uh, I'll just share my slides. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, there. Please let me know if you can't see them. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the links between skills and productivity and the regional and spatial dimension of that. And I'm using the UK as a case study, but I will give examples of other countries and how I think they, um, they're similar or different and what we can learn from different experiences. So I thought I'd start by maybe saying a little bit about the productivity issue in the UK and the regional dimension of it, and then um, and then I'll, I'll show you how I think it links to skills. So in the UK, we have had in in the 1990s and 2000s, there was a period of um, rapid productivity growth, where by productivity I mean output per person or per hour worked, um, and this was due. There's a lot of research on this, and um, the it's the consensus is that this was due to innovation. Um, total factor productivity, so institutional changes, um, investments in capital and an increase in skills, where the increase in skills is um, mainly in higher education, so a big increase in the number of graduates. And then after the um, financial crisis in 2007 and afterwards, um, there was a big decline in productivity and essentially ever since productivity growth has been flat or even negative. Um, in contrast to other countries where it has recovered. Um, and uh, depending on how you measure this, and there's some controversy, but in general, productivity levels in the UK, at both levels and growth rates, are now well below those of other comparable countries. And the question is, why is this happening? And the research um, shows that this is partly due to a decline in total factor productivity, so innovation and institutions and so on, and all the other things that are not capital and labour, um, and small declines in uh, investment in capital, but also um, there is some evidence that part of it is due to uh, a reduction or low levels of on-the-job training. So the UK has very low levels of training um, once uh, employees are, are employed by their own employer. Um, which is, uh, I'll come back to a bit later on. Um, there's also an issue with um, a long tail in the distribution of low productivity firms. So while there are some, uh, there is a section of the um, distribution of firms that has very high productivity levels, particularly in London and the southeast of the country, there is a, a large number of firms, there are a large number of firms that have poor management practices, uh, low rates of technology adoption and low levels of training and uh, uh, therefore bringing down the productivity levels and growth rates. Um, this, I think, uh, is a, a, um, a diagram and it shows quite nicely the problem. So we have the um, 
the the orange line it shows the uh, the trend up to 2007 in productivity levels measured as output per hour worked and then we can see what happens after the crisis um, we have the the dashed red line which is the um, the expected trend and we have the orange line which shows you what actually happened productivity levels and you can see that they're essentially flat but but what this hides is important regional differences so some regions are actually growing um, and some regions are declining and so on average it looks like productivity is flat and then this is compared comparing the uk to other countries we can see the uk is at 100 in this index and as you can see, other comparable countries in Europe, for example, Germany, France and Italy have significantly higher productivity levels. Um, uh, the only country that does worse than us within the, the G7 or the OECD um, is Japan. And I'll talk about some of the reasons why um, in a minute. And then looking at the regional picture, this is um, productivity levels in measured as um, uh, output per hour works across regions in the EU. Um, this is the latest, the last map that we have where the UK is still included in, um, in, in the figures, but it's quite informative, I think. So, um, so the blue shaded areas are above the EU average and the um, purple and pink areas are below the average. And you can see, I hope, quite clearly in the UK, uh, in London and the southeast, um, uh, the productivity levels are above, uh, significantly above the EU average. Um, but in other areas, um, more peripheral areas in Cornwall, in Wales, in parts of the northeast um, and so on. Um, the levels are significantly below the EU average and comparable to um, regions in, in the south of Europe, or the, um, on the periphery of the south of Europe and the east of Europe. So, um, so you can see quite, quite strikingly the big disparities in productivity. Uh, this is just a picture showing the long tail. So these are the distribution of productivity levels for firms across the different regions. And um, the two um, uh, sort of graphs that are uh, lines that are um, sort of further to the uh, to the right of the diagram are London and the southeast. They have a higher proportion of high productivity firms, but you can see that for some of the other regions, there's quite a significant number of firms that are well below um, so the average for the country, which is the dashed line. Okay, how is this related to skills? So. Um, there, there is some good news, which is that research has shown that skills in the UK actually contributed quite significantly to productivity growth in a positive way. So the picture would have been much worse if we didn't have such a high um, proportion of graduate uh, enrollment in higher education and such a large number of high quality universities. Um, so both in the pre and the post crisis period, skills had a positive contribution to productivity growth. Um, but as I, I'll show you in a minute, there are big disparities in skill levels across the country and they are growing. So unless we address that, we will continue. Um, we, um, this positive contribution might not continue into the future. Um, just also to mention that the, product, the contribution of skills to productivity growth in the UK is the highest for any um, uh, of the OECD countries except for the Netherlands in some of the periods. So skills are really important to our productivity growth. OK, um, in terms of which skills have uh, the biggest impact on productivity growth, um, we can see there's a strong association, a positive association with higher education skills because we have such a large um, proportion of population enrolling in higher education and because our universities are spread across the country and also high quality. We do have uh, low and declining levels of uh, on the job training. This is particularly worrying. Um, we have low levels uh, or declining levels in adult literacy um, to the extent that our young adult literacy results in standardized tests like PISA are actually worse than those of older adults and also significant problems with basic numeracy skills. And we have the also the worst spatial inequalities in skills in Europe, and this is at all levels of uh, the sort of all age groups, so starting from preschool all the way up to higher education. 
um, they, they get worse progressively. So the preschool differences in, in terms of uh, test scores of children when they enter primary uh, are not as bad as the test scores in primary and secondary schools. So they worsen over time It's a cumulative process. OK, um, I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about the theory on how skills are produced and then I'll come back to the policy discussion. Um, so the so within educational um, education economics, the, uh, the theory is that individuals have a number of skills and these skills are varied and they include both cognitive and non-cognitive skills where cognitive skills are those related to reasoning and analysis and thinking and non-cognitive skills are those related to personality and social skills. Uh, I'll come back to the issue of non-cognitive skills in a minute because it's I think really important. And then we assume that the production of skills, um, so where they come from, is a function of uh, genetic um, environments, so the genetic inheritance and also the environment where the environment includes the family, the school and the neighbourhood. So in policy terms, this is where we have to focus if we're thinking of um, addressing disparities in skills. And there are two other important features that we can um, we generally assume that skills have. Um, the first one is self productivity. Uh, this means that early skills augment, feed into later skills. So investing in early skills um, is much more effective because of the cumulative process um, and the fact that it augments later skills. And the second one is complementarities in that different skills reinforce each other in producing positive outcomes like higher incomes, productivity, um, health benefits and so on. So when we're thinking about investing in, in different um, policies to to promote skills, we need to think about how they interact with each other and particularly how cognitive and non-cognitive skills work together. Um, this is a, a nice diagram, I think, from a, a very useful review paper by Cunha et al. Um, um, on the uh, literature, on the, uh, the history of the literature on uh, education economics and uh, also sociology of education. And what this diagram summarizes is the return to investment um, in, at different levels of the age distribution. So the um, a pound invested in preschool programs has a much higher return because of the fact that the, 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 the foundations laid in preschool um, help children to um, accumulate skills more quickly. So investing in preschool programs has a higher return than investing in primary and secondary school, and that in turn has a higher return than post-school um, human capital investments. OK, now I'm com to, coming now to the issue of non-cognitive skills. So these are um, sometimes called softer skills, but they're essentially social skills. And, and there are things like patience, um, self-control, discipline, empathy, openness, conscientiousness, and so on. Uh, things that are both um, important for within the schooling system, so for um, uh, having the motivation and the discipline to learn, um, and also in the workplace. And the literature shows that both cognitive and non-cognitive skills can be produced uh, and changed up to the age of 10. Um, in theory, up to the age of 20, but the biggest um, impact is in the period from uh, birth up to the age of 10. Um, and then this suggests, together with the uh, rate of return findings, that the um, intervening early has the biggest impact. And uh, when we're looking at the outcomes, for example, we're looking at IQ uh, levels or, or PISA scores or, or, or other schooling uh, school results, um, we have to keep in mind that these reflect both uh, cognitive and non-cognitive skills and the environment that has shaped them. Um, and, and this is where we need to address, uh, but that we need to address with policy. Um, I thought I'd give you an example of a preschool intervention. Uh, I think it's a very nice one because it highlights the importance of diversity in skills. So you may know this already. Um, it's a very famous uh, um, policy uh, initiative um, that was uh, carried out in the US in the 1960s. 
um, and is famous because it was rigorously evaluated. So it was an attempt at a randomized um, uh, ex policy experiment and the um, outcomes have been followed ever since. So the children who were involved in this program were followed for uh, I think 40 years afterwards to see what their um, outcomes were. Um, the sample is uh, quite small, 128 children. Uh, these were selected from um, a, a, a population of children who were at high risk of uh, dropping out of school. Um, and this is because of the uh, educational background of their parents and general deprivation background. So they were selected at, at random from a sample of disadvantaged um, ethnic minority families in Michigan. And to give you some background, the um, uh, about half of them came from single parent households where the single parent was a, a female and the average age of maternal schooling uh, were in the sample were um, 9.4 years where um, you need 12 years to finish high school. So these were mostly, um, I mean, the sample, nearly all of them had dropped out of high school. I mean, the parents. Um, and then the treated children received two and a half hours of preschool education every day. And that focused on developing both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So um, also discipline and so on, in order to give them the best start in their schooling life. Um, they also, there were also weekly parental sessions to show the parents how they could support their children in their schooling. And then, as I said, their progress was followed up to the age of 40. So I'm going to show you what happened. Um, this first diagram shows the IQ test results for the treated and the, the control group children. So the, the grey line on top is the treated group and you can see uh, this is the point of entry and the intervention was in the first year up to the age of four um, before they started school. So you can see a big improvement in IQ um, test scores for the treated children and the scores remain high all the way up to uh, 10 years uh, in the schooling system. Of course the intervention stopped after the uh, age of five and the benefits are, um, fall over time and then at the age of 10 there's no difference between the treated and the control group. However there are big differences in life outcomes which is quite interesting. So we see here the differences in the treated and control group uh, groups of um, uh, different schooling outcomes. The treated groups are the dark gray on top, um, bar on top. So the treated children, children in the treated group were significantly less likely to need um, special remedial education. They were significantly more likely to have a high achievement at the age of 14 in their schooling grades and significantly more likely to graduate on time from high school. They're also, and this is even more striking, they're more likely to earn a higher wage, uh, much more likely to own their own home and more likely, significantly more likely to never have been on welfare as an adult. And then I find this the most interesting. This is, these are um, looking at crime um, engagement in, cr in criminal activity and as you can see compared to the control group the treated group here below were significantly less likely to uh, commit crimes and at the by the age of 40 have been arrested for a crime by the age of 40 and this is across all kinds of crime so while we don't see an impact on IQ levels in the long run we do see significant positive impacts on all sorts of social and economic outcomes. And the, the, um, the, the conclusion, I think, is that this is due to the non-cognitive skills that were taught during the, the preschool program. And these might be things like confidence and discipline and openness to new ideas and so on. OK, so that's a small detour. And now I'm going back to the disparities in skills in the UK and what I think is causing them and how we might want to address them using policy. So I'm going to start and, uh, with preschool and then move up the ages. Um, so as I mentioned, there are very significant geographical differences at all levels of the, the um, skill outcomes. So starting with preschool, we see uh, worse outcomes in terms of the, the basic level of knowledge, uh, sort of skills of children when they enter primary school in uh, outside of London and the southeast. Um, London does relatively well despite high levels of deprivation and low provision. So it's, it's harder to get a high quality preschool place in London and yet the, the results are better. 
than expected. And this is known as the London paradox, and I think has something to do with the context of living in a city where there are other types of provision. I'm uh, happy to discuss this later um, if there's interest. Then we see a significantly widening gap in at the secondary school level, and this is very persistent and it has to, I think my next slide, so it has, it has something to do with parental background in particular parental income and educational background um, in the sense that the parents are less able to help their children with their schooling. Um, there's a lot of uh, stressors in the in the family environment and this affects um, grades. So it's linked to deprivation uh, essentially. And then jumping uh, so going across to higher education, um, as I said earlier, we have uh, very high levels of enrollment. We have uh, many good quality universities and then um, importantly our universities are spread quite evenly across space so they're not concentrated in the high productivity high growth regions for historical reasons uh, which which is good and in fact it lessens the geographical disparities however even when looking at um, higher education we see um, disparities in access um, to, this is to do with um, schools and motivation and um, uh, knowing how to apply and where to apply and so on. Um, most students attend their local universities, so improving and providing local higher education opportunities has a, a big effect on access. There is also the issue of um, where graduates go after they finish university and uh, the fact that London attracts a very high proportion of graduates in the UK um, and an even higher proportion of international graduates who come to the UK to work. And the larger cities in the UK do, do particularly badly in terms of attracting international graduates and this is a big problem uh, in terms of uh, the impact on productivity. So towards the end I've got a few policy ideas on this. Um, I just want to say now just finally a few words on what attracts graduates. So um, as I mentioned we have disparities at all levels, there are things we can do to invest uh, in early years and in schooling and in improving access to higher education, um, but what do we do about graduates migrating to the successful areas? Um, this is a picture of a neighbourhood in Montreal, Mile End, and it's, uh, it's famous for being one of the uh, neighbourhoods that most uh, techie graduates want to work in, so it has a very high quality of life. Um, as you can see in the picture, cycling lanes, cycle lanes, uh, cafes, quirky buildings, interesting, um, you know, neighbours and so on. So what can a city do that is in a declining area with low productivity levels, low salaries? What can they do to attract graduates and improve their productivity prospects? Um, so this is from ongoing, this, um, these are some results from an ongoing research project looking at what drives graduates to settle in different places in the UK. And here I'm looking at, uh, these are I think uh, graduates from 2006, although the um, results don't vary much over time. What is it that drives them to a region? And um, these are some variables here, and the uh, I'm looking at the the these variables in the or in the destination where they end up relative to where they started, um, and these are all standardized, so we can compare different variables. So what, what we find, what I find, is that earnings and house prices, so the costs of living versus the earnings, potential earnings, are the biggest drivers. Um, and particularly for graduates with top grades, where earnings um, are the single most important driver. Um, unemployment rates don't have such a big impact. Um, they actually, um, graduates go to places that have higher unemployment rates. And this is because some of them return back home because they can't find a job. And also because cities tend to have higher levels of unemployment. Um, top graduates with top grades tend to avoid high unemployment places. I also looked at the weather, which has an impact, so um, a climate that has higher high rainfall and uh, high temperature extremes tends to, um, to be less desirable. And then finally, skipping population density, just these last two, these are measures of the cultural uh, aspects of the city or the, the, 
the local area and um, heritage index is a measure of the quality of the buildings, the aesthetic quality and we can see that there is some impact so graduates are driven to places that look interesting or pleasant um, to live in particularly the top graduates with top grades and openness is a measure of how open to um, the area is welcoming and again we can see this has some impact but particularly for the top graduates Okay, um, I want to finish with a policy which is slightly um, provocative idea. So um, if there is an issue of attracting UK based graduates and um, I think my view is that it is easier to keep them in the region than to attract them afterwards. So once your graduates have left the region to study elsewhere and then gone to London, it's really hard to bring them back. However, keeping them in the region by having high quality uh, courses, higher education institutions, maybe as part of the local um, FE uh, Further Education College is a, a, a much more um, uh, a policy that's much more likely to succeed, I think. But there is also also the issue of how to attract international graduates or international um, migrants that have the right skills, not necessarily um, um, very high skill levels, but the, the right kinds of, skill, of skills for the region, which could be agricultural skills or, or manufacturing skills. Um, and so one option would be to have an immigration policy that has regional differentiation. So, for example, a, an easy thing to do would be to, to vary the salary requirements and visa fee surcharges that the employer pays in some regions. So uh, regions that have a great need for certain types of workers um, could have um, some sort of slightly more lenient visa requirements. Um, you could also remove the restrictions on how quickly immigrants can apply for um, permanent settled status in some regions in order to encourage them to stay. Um, you could have regional specific entries on the shortage occupation list so that um, you can add, uh, there's a specific shortage in one region um, that is added to the um, shortage occupation list. Um, but only for jobs in that particular region. So that um, this means that it is, it is easier for um, migrants to get a visa if they're on that list for that region. And then finally, in some countries like in Canada and also in Australia, um, the regions um, sponsor migrants directly. So migrants receive extra points in a point-based system. And now that the UK has moved to a points-based system, this would be something that could be implemented. Um, the difficulties in how to retain them in the region once they've had they've received the visa and whether to compel them as Australia does so they can't get a job anywhere else, or to focus on integration, which is what the Canadian system does. OK, um, I had a few words on training and I think it links quite nicely to the previous presentation because um, so I mentioned earlier at the very beginning that we have very low training rates. So our employers provide very little training for their workers and there is a debate about whether universities should be doing more training for specific jobs or whether it's the employer's role. Um, so our training rates are, are, are very bad, um, second only to Japan. We also have a very large number of overqualified graduates. So we have um, graduates in surveys saying that they're not using their skills and also employers saying that they can't get skilled workers. So there's clearly a mismatch and it has to do with the employers not training their workers properly for the particular job. Um, and these low levels of training are um, particularly striking for workers who are on zero hours contracts, flexible contracts and uh, in jobs that are at risk of automation. So where perhaps both the workers and the employers don't think it's worthwhile to train the workers. Um, also for workers who are self-employed, uh, older and female. So this is a very big issue and mm, there have been some attempts to try to solve this, but not very successfully. We also have large disparities in lifelong learning and in training uh, across the UK. So my final slide, I just have a few points on, I wanted to say a few things on policy. So the first one is the crucial importance of non-cognitive skills, which I think comes out quite strongly in some of the literature, but is a neglected area in both 
on the policy side and on the academic research side as well. So all the focus in the policy discourse seems to be on schooling and teacher training and um, what to provide at university, but there's very little on what particular skills are needed. Um, also, I think there's excessive focus on the supply side, so um, putting more money into education or a provision of education, schools and so on, and very little on the demand for skills from employers and why they why they, they say they, they, they can't find workers with the right skills and why they're not providing training. Uh, the issue of training, I think, is really crucial. And in addition to the preschool, um, lack of uh, preschool provision, I think is one of the biggest problems in the UK at the moment. And likely to get worse as more workers move on to these um, flexible hours contracts. And then finally, a disconnection between skills policy and other policy areas like management practices, mental health, although there's some attempts now in Manchester to link these um, transport uh, and so on and immigration. Um, so that I think that's all I've got to say. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. Yeah. And and I, I would say that 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 between the two of you, you've you've created a very big job for Federica. <laughs> because these two, I mean, got two uh, presentations which are not only fascinating but full of so much information. And uh, so let's 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 see what Federica does with it. Okay, so um, well, I thought that this discussion was extremely interesting of how you know the regional productivity growth patterns are affected by a variety of factors, uh, and there is a particular focus on education on Maria's presentation. Yeah, if you just move to the next slide. So all I want to um, do is to present some common threads and some emerging questions on the presentations of today, particularly on the issue of regional inequality and productivity growth rates uh, in this discussion of innovation opportunities, resilient to crisis. And actually it struck me that both uh, of your uh, in presentations start from the point of a crisis triggering some uh, reckoning, you know, uh, for Stavanger, um, for, for Norway, the, the, the oil prices, and for the UK, the financial crisis of 2007, which has brought to light this problem with productivity. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, um, I found I picked on a couple of issues, okay, that I thought would be interesting to discuss in the context of this uh, of this debate. First of all, to me, is the role of the digital economy. So when we discuss particularly, and I think this was the, the topic of sectoral composition uh, emerged in uh, um, Marta's presentation, maybe uh, it was very briefly touched upon in Maria's presentation. But the point is, you know, the sectoral composition of the economy matters a lot for productivity. We have sectors where productivity increases are much higher, particularly in high technology sector, in manufacturing, we know that, you know, there is a discrepancy between productivity in high tech and low tech manufacturing, but also in the service sector. And increasingly, I think the rise of the digital economy has actually exacerbated this divide, you know, between more high tech services and low tech traditional services and, and the productivity growth rate in these areas are likely to be different and actually uh, spreading apart as time goes on. So I am wondering whether the rise of the regional, the digital economy has played a role in exacerbating uh, regional inequalities uh, because of this differential between high and low tech services um, and the fact that, uh, you know, tech sectors and particularly the digital tech sectors, you know, they're connected to the internet economy and so on, which are all the rage now, they are very geographically concentrated. And if these sectors are very, you know, drive productivity increases and they concentrate in particular areas, they might be fueling further regional inequality. And we know that digital firms seek specialized skills and financing, which are found in uh, specific areas much more than in others. So there is a problem there. We know from the work of Fred, Simona, and Mar Marianne Feldman, um, you know, about it, even financing, you know, gets collected all over the country and then it gets distributed in very specific areas. And, and, and so there is a process of inequality generation uh, through those mechanisms as well. 
So do you think the rise of the regional economy plays a role in your story about productivity and regional equality? I'm thinking particularly about the UK because I don't know enough about Norway. <laughs> Um, is the problem a growing tale of low productivity firms across the board or is the problem a growing discrepancy of productivity across the industries, you know, sort of highly productive, high digital tech and low productive traditional services or is the problem of both? So do we have this divide within sectors and between sectors as well? Next slide, please. And then when you think about uh, the digital economy I, I was just thinking about covid you know that and, and inequality the, the covid pandemic that is sprang to mind and i was thinking well you know if technology now we are all we've all been forced to uh, engage with this you know the, the use of distance uh, well technologies which enable interactions at distance working from home Will this mean that more and more people will be able, particularly graduates, to stay or move to low productivity regions while still keeping their highly skilled jobs? If that's the case, could they have a positive effect on the reduction of productivity differentials? Because perhaps not immediately, because these processes take a long time and maybe, you know, you still have the problem that a lot of revenue gets imputed to their headquarters rather than to the place where the workers are. So perhaps it might not be apparent immediately, but over time, you know, maybe you start seeing positive effects of having more graduates uh, staying in low productivity regions, for example, because they will demand knowledge intensive services, they will be more entrepreneurial, so perhaps you will start seeing positive effects. Is this too optimistic? I'm wondering, you know, because maybe this model only applies to certain industries, it might not have any effect in others. Um, but if that is possible, then what kind of policy might facilitate local attention of graduates in a post-pandemic uh, world? Um, and uh, I mean, for example, personally, you know, when we discuss policies about immigration and so on, I was just thinking, you know, policies that make it attractive for people to live in certain areas could be could be valuable, and it's, it's difficult because you know it is. Uh, some of them might not appeal to very liberal <laughs> or liberalist uh, governments, for example, you know, making sure that, you know, rents are controlled, that, uh, um, you know, that the prices, how prices do not spiral, that uh, when there is greater demand, that, for example, um, you know, commuting prices uh, are kept low so that people can work in an area and commute maybe occasionally to a big city without spending too much, you know, this kind of thing. Um, this kind of policies could be interesting, but not necessarily politically appealing. Um, however, personally, I find that policies that aim at making areas more attractive place to live have a greater potential of success than policies that rely on you know, tying migrations to specific regions, which have, I think they have a number of downsides, such as, um, you know, hampering integration, limiting personal freedom, and also perhaps, I don't know if how successful they would be in the long run if that was the only policy that was, uh, you know, used. Uh, so I think, you know, making the regions more attractive places to live in becomes important as well. Um, uh, next slide, please, Ola. Oh, I had a point about graduate mobility and graduate retention as well. And that to me is, uh, you know, not just the quality, but also the diversity of local competences. And this is a point that probably relates also to Marcus' presentation, you know, what type of skills are retained in peripheral low productivity regions and which ones move away? And I was thinking that, well, you know, um, and perhaps I'm reconnecting here with some of the work that Fred has done in the past as well on the link between you know on the on the on the availability of specialized versus general skills and uh, well the provision of uh, um, certain specialized competences is not uniform you know so for example more specialized degrees like stem like even the humanities they tend to be offered by more intensive research intensive more prestigious institutions and therefore, they tend to also cluster in those high productivity cities, you know, and you are less likely to find the offer of these uh, uh, courses in low productivity regions. And perhaps the demand is also uh, not there. So I'm wondering whether the graduates that you find staying in low productivity regions are not only 
fewer in number, but perhaps they have different profiles. You know, maybe they do have more generic profiles. Maybe they do more generic business degrees or professional degrees like teaching and nursing. I'm wondering whether that has an implication for the profiles of competences that you find in a region and whether, you know, should, for example, can we foster greater diversity of local competences? Um, could universities be encouraged to, you know, and again, this is a very difficult point to make because the university sector is encouraged to be more and more market led and respond to demand rather than respond to political or policy priorities. So, uh, you know, but is there a role for a government to encourage universities, you know, to teach them in, you know, peripheral regions, for example? It's, 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 a, it's an interesting question to me, but uh, I would this even work, you know, <laughs> would, it, would it work at all? This, this idea? Final point. So next slide, please. Um, at this point of systematicity, uh, you know, we uh, talk about uh, this discussion is necessarily a discussion about the systemic factors that underpin these processes, sectoral composition, distribution of competences, quality of local education, retention and mobility of graduates, entrepreneurial opportunities. These are all factors that are systemically related. And the question is, you know, do we need to think about systemic policy interventions and who should enact them? You know, and to me, there is a problem of governance here. You know, who should put these interventions in place? And in fact, in relation to Marty's presentation, I was wondering, you know, when you were talking about the narratives that these regions were presenting, who was elaborating these narratives? Were the people elaborating the narratives the same people who had governance responsibilities for the regions, for example? Um, and uh, yeah, I think that the problem of, you know, how to govern the system, systemic process is a big, a big problem and a big, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> question mark. So that's it from me. I think these are the main issues I picked up uh, from these very interesting presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, now, now that we don't have slides here, I'd like to encourage any anybody who uh, is uh, not is in a situation where they they can be displayed exactly? Thank you, Cara. Cara, uh, it, it, uh, to turn turn on your camera, we can actually converse here more or less. Um, other questions? I don't see any. Uh, yeah, Cara. There is Grazia waiting for a long time. Ah, is that Grazia? Oh, Grazia, Grazia. Show your face, Grazia. No. Well, well. OK, let's go where's, ahead. Where's Grazia? She let, uh, no, she's there. Come on. Hello. Can you hear me? Now we can, yes, good. OK, fine, fine. Um, I enjoyed all three papers. Thank you very much indeed. I have a question for um, uh, Maria, which is also related to something that Federica said. And uh, it's the question is, well, actually there are two questions. First of all, when you measure um, productivity, have you been a able at all to take account of the degree of utilization of capacity? And to what extent is the low productivity after 2007 in the UK due to um, the um, low level of uh, utilization of capacity, the effect that the economy was depressed? That's the first question. The second one is to do with the um, comparisons between countries. And particularly, I wonder whether you any thought has been given to the sectoral breakdown between countries. Are, the, are countries with high productivity, do they have a different a structure in terms of the sectors involved. For example, I mean, during the COVID, there's been a lot of, uh, right, rightly, a lot of fuss about the hospitality um, 
industry in Britain, which is really a very large sector, but it's not a, a sector with high productivity. So, you know, are we stuck into sectors with low productivity? The traditional one where there was high productivity and high potential for high increase in productivity was the manufacturing one, which is a very small in Britain. So how much is the sectoral uh, element relevant? And I think this takes us also to Federica, who was looking at the disparity between regions. Um, and then a, a very uh, point regarding what Federica was saying about the, the digital sector is more capital intensive. I don't think it is more capital intensive. It is high productivity uh, in spite of low capital intensity. The capital intensity is very high for, uh, you know, companies like Fiat or uh, Nissan and so on. You can see why. But oddly enough, the digital sector manages very high productivity in spite of relatively low um, level of uh, uh, capital intensity. So I think that is actually one issue which ought to be looked at, in fact. So I've I, I finished. Sorry, I carried on for too long. So, thank you, uh, Fred. Oh, thank you. Good. Um, who wants to start here? Maria? Yep, I'm happy to start. So, um, I want to start on the sectoral issue because the um, it is true there are set, sectoral differences across countries, but um, the issue in the UK is um, more of a regional problem, I think. So even if we compare the same sectors across countries, what we find is um, flat productivity growth in the UK. Um, for example, the UK has a very similar sectoral composition to France, but France is, has much higher productivity levels. So uh, there's a famous statistic that France, I don't know how accurate it is, but that France uh, produce in four days what we produce in five. Um, so it is um, a regional issue in the sense that we have some regions that are highly productive, among the most productive in the OECD, and then we have some regions that are uh, have very low productivity levels. And so on average, we look average. Um, yeah, and the other issue I think with the UK, maybe related to the sectoral issue that we have a very uh, large uh, services sector, including um, low productivity services, and we have um, many workers on um, um, flexible hours contracts, um, which are very insecure and foster all sorts of problems, including low productivity. So I think the two differences in the UK are the, uh, rather than the sectoral issue, the a regional issue and a um, uh, employment practices issue. Um, then on the on the low capacity, low utilization, I'm not an expert on measurement of productivity, but I believe that this is um, accounted for in those measures. So it is whatever labor is in the labor force at the time and what their skills are and the capital that has that is already in place but uh, I, I can't say much more about that maybe federica is an expert <laughs> yeah maybe i can uh, jump in here um i don't have a um it's just about this digitalization and also the comment by Grazia here and what you also mentioned, Maria. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation. I really uh, loved it and I have so many questions that I would like to ask you as well. And I, th I found some of the points that you had also these interventions and decline on the job training were really, really interesting. And I think this decline on the job training, what you mentioned, uh, you said that this is, you know, worrisome and, and, and really going into what that is. I think we will see that a lot more. We've seen that in the policy side in Norway, going more into um, after COVID-19, a lot of people lost their jobs. So going into this lifelong learning perspectives and policies, I think it's very interesting. But I just wanted to jump in with a little comment on this digitalization because 
Um, we've been uh, since March last year investigating um, all uh, like innovative companies in Norway in terms of digitalization. And we saw that all the companies in these different surveys that we've done and interviews, they have had an increased um, focus on digitalization and they've had a change in sort of digital acceptance and, and in terms of clients and also with the work that they do inside. But we've seen that that has mostly been in the side of dig uh, digitization. So it's more like you know, having these meetings that we're having right now. And um, so so it's not necessarily going deep into the production side of things. And interestingly enough, we don't find these big regional differences when it comes to digitalization. What is most important is how digitalized they were uh, before the crisis. So we see that both for the greening of the industry, but uh, all, uh, all industries, so how green they are, but also like digitalization has often been depicted as sort of twin transitions. We see that how green or how digitalized they were before COVID-19 is also how green and digitalized they are uh, as per now. But the most big, the biggest difference we see in here is um, differences in uh, young and, and older companies. So we really see that um, the, the new established and entrepreneurs that are focusing on digitalized, they're also not these teams digitalization, sort of low threshold. They are digitalized within what they're actually offering, the whole business model. So that is also a big difference that 55% of them say that we are better than um, the established companies when it comes to it. And I just want to mention another very interesting part is that um, so yeah, so it's not the geographical location, like access to people, networks, etc., local bus that is the, is the most important, but it is the degree of digitalization that they have. But a lot of these companies in the rural areas, they mentioned that they that now it's an equal playing field because they can sit anywhere and sort of sell their goods and services uh, to uh, all over the place. But where we see that it's easy for them to maintain this contact that they had with already existing uh, people or networks, but it's increasingly harder to do so uh, to new um, to new companies and establish new contacts. So here, this and also since digitalization is a loss of relational capital in many ways, there is a job to do also in terms of increasing the competence when it comes to digitalization and using digital tools and trust and how to do that. But also in terms of this on the job training that you mentioned, I think uh, could be um, very, very interesting to uh, and, and the role of, of higher education institutions here in terms of taking an action uh, for the increase of competence when it comes to digitalization and when it comes to uh, greening of the economy. So that was just a, a little bit some small comments on the digitalization. I'll give the word to someone else. Thanks, thank you very much. And and we Chiara, some, yeah, Chiara, maybe and me. Wanted to get I, in. I, I, Chiara, you had a question before. Uh, yes, I do. I do. Well, I don't know. I saw that Simona was really like, you know, maybe she wanted to make a point. No, no. All right. OK. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to both Marta and Maria. I really enjoyed both the presentation and I think that like, you know, the question would be for both. So I was interested in understanding a bit more the second presentation of Marta, the one that she didn't have the time to expand upon and specifically <laughs> what were her results in terms of the relevance of the unrelated educational diversity. So what, what is it and what were the results? And that to some extent, I mean, I could I could pinch into Maria's presentation in a number of different ways, but remaining on that topic, uh, uh, I thought like, you know, you at some point mentioned that you're doing work about graduates and uh, what is fostering uh, the choices to settle uh, in the place where they study in the UK. And because that, is a theme very dear to me. I was wondering if you could share something on that. OK, before before we get answers to these questions, uh, let's sort of stack up a few questions here at, because we'll, we're, we're, we're running low on time. OK, so uh, uh, Simona. Yeah, I, I, I wanted first of all to congratulate both speakers and uh, and uh, discussant because it's been one of the most interesting events of the last few months. It's good that we uh, that that other people will be able to to look at it on the web. I I just said something that. Uh, relates uh, to Marta's presentation, but then feeds uh, also in Maria's presentation. I was very pleased, Marta, to see that you present a story that is not only, uh, uh, you know, 
on the structure, conduct, performance, all the Bain structuralism, but that gives, you know, uh, lights and shades to both models. Diversification and specialization. Interestingly, after 10 years of diversification related, they're more related, less related, it starts to be new evidence that actually the most resilient regions in the last few years seems to be very specialized. The problem is where and which skills. And here, I think this is the case of um, Germany, but also this, the case of some of the best Italian places. And this means somehow that can be related to skills that are supported by constant training on the job, off the job, Germany for sure, okay? So uh, uh, I wanted to hear about this story because we have predicated, I am one of the responsible to this relatedness, diversification at any cost, but I believe that maybe, I mean, coupling together skills and sectors, I mean, th there are different types of transitions. It's not necessarily towards more diversified. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to add to this stack of questions at this point? I um, don't see any 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 hands up. Okay, um, I'll I'll add uh, one thing for Maria, uh, which which is just on this this problem of in the UK of of of, of mismatch of you know sort of oversupply of degrees and employers complaining about lack of skills. Do, do, do you see any solution to that in a situation where you've got uh, basically declining job security and, and, and really hopefully inadequate unemployment insurance? Um, whose motivation is it, whether employee or employer, to invest in any skills? In any in any in, in any specific skills that are, are you know going to be required only for certain situations and may become obsolete. Um, I may have answered my own question just in 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 the framing, but I, I if you have an answer to that, I I I I I I'd love to know. Um, and Marta, at at the end of your presentation, I realized uh, that there was a there was a, a a time issue, but I I um, really been wondering. You you um, when you 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 came back to birds of a feather uh, in there in in uh, Stavanger, and I was wondering if this was taking us back to your initial finding about the. The immigrants, the outsiders, uh, lacking opportunity. I mean, was this more of an issue in that specialized region than in Bergen? Um, any other questions here? Not in a few minutes. We'll. We'll. Uh, who would like to start? I can go and uh, there are a few related questions I think on the issue of types of skills and who's responsible for investing in them um, which is why I found uh, what Marty said very interesting on unrelated I may have got the meaning wrong but my own strong view from reading the literature and the policy attempt to fix it is that the it's not the role of universities to teach specific skills that are matched to specific employers. So yeah. there have been attempts, particularly the new universities, to to design curricula with employers. And they're very successful, but of course the, the, the graduate then goes to that employer, the moment they have a few, a little bit of experience, they move to another region. So it's not a way of keeping uh, people in the region. I think it, it doesn't seem to work. Whereas I think investing in general skills, and then 
encouraging somehow the employers to provide training or to have some sort of national lifelong training training system, I think is much more effective. Together with, um, as Federica said, other ways of retaining or attracting people to regions which have to do with the quality of life. Um, and maybe there's more scope for doing that now with COVID, after COVID, because there'll be at least some uh, uh, sort of working from home shifts. Um, I have seen it quite that happening very strongly in my area, in the fence, uh, quite far away from any sort of exciting place. We have seen, there's no policy intervention, but we have seen cafes and other community facilities springing up naturally um, to cater for everybody who's at home. So who knows? But uh, sorry, that's my very, uh, and Kiara, I'm happy to share some more uh, findings. We can do it over email maybe. Uh, I, I just want to echo that, and I think Thank that's uh, I think that's very interesting what you said, Maria, and, and also what Simona was asking, and also touching upon what you said, Frederick. I mean, we have some some work that we are uh, working on now that are also looking into the creativity stimulated practices that are in companies and finding that, I mean, the fundamental question of whether these experience based knowledge that we have looked upon about interact with organizational practices to shape innovation and productivity. And we do find that that these practices are very, very important. And, and those are, for example, um, engagement in um, like job rotation and also in terms of uh, multidisciplinary teams, uh, um, brainstorming sessions. So be able to actually see what are you doing inside the firm, not only like, OK, you have this related or unrelated variety and there, that's in the company, but what what do you actually do to engage and try to sort of leverage the potential of that diversity being utilized? And I think that speaks to what you mentioned about this on the job training and, and what are you actually doing in the workplace to sort of take advantage of it? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And also to your point, uh, Chara, I think I have also a lot of, um, uh, you mentioned a little bit this unrelated educational diversity. So, I think this particular like, uh, uh, paper that I was talking about here is, is quite different because you had you had this external shock. So the idea was that you had uh, people in the workforce that had combined very different educational uh, backgrounds could lead to uh, when you had this external shock, find more complementary or alternative ways to sort of find uh, revenue streams, whilst it could perhaps hamper it in a normal situation because then it's um, it's business as usual. So, um, but I'm happy to share also um, the paper if you would like to read uh, more about them. <laughs> read more about it, but yeah. I think we will. I think we will. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank but, you, Mark, but, uh, one, uh, one point I just yeah. want, sorry Frederick, but I wanted to say thank you to Federica as well for her excellent points. Uh, this That was just amazing. Thank you. Me too, me too, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a video of this for anybody you want to share it with and uh, 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 look forward to further discussions. Thank you all again. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.